ladies and gentlemen, please welcome lead developer for Spring Batch and Cloud Task, Pivotal, Michael Manella. Wow, what? Wow, <laughs> let's try that again. <laughs> wow, what an amazing week we ha we've had this week. We've learned about all kinds of really cool technologies. Things like Knative and Riff and the capabilities it brings to us. We've talked about Kubernetes and PKS and PAS and Cloud Foundry, cool platforms that you can do really amazing things with. We've talked about new features in Spring Boot and the new data, data stuff in, in Reactor. However, I'm the last guy. And they saved the last guy to talk about the hottest, coolest technologies you're going to hear about at this conference, batch processing. Now you laugh, but even the Cloud Native Computing Foundation specifically calls out in their white paper on serverless, batch jobs and scheduled tasks as a use case that they're targeting for that kind of platform. Because we've seen, as workloads are moving to the cloud or in modern platforms, batch processing is following. When I was researching this, uh, or getting ready for this talk, I um, found a project on GitHub uh, that uh, somebody's actually running COBOL in a serverless environment. So I actually asked the, cert, the, the Rift team, so roadmap, COBOL, what you guys think? Still waiting for an answer if anybody's out there from the Rift team. <laughs> Get some applause back there. <laughs> um, I'm not going to talk about moving uh, batch processes to even a serverless environment, but. The, the point here is, is that modern platforms like PAS and PKS are two very capable, well-recommended platforms for running batch applications. But why move batch to the cloud or a modern platform? A few different reasons. And frankly, they're all the same reasons you're moving all your other workloads. For example, increased productivity. Your customer-facing experiences are iterating faster and faster. You're deploying you know, multiple times a week, multiple times a day. Your back-end systems need to keep up that pace. They need to support those systems. In order to get that kind of agility, you need to move to a more modern platform. On-demand scalability. If you're running your batch platforms on raw metal or VMs or on a mainframe, you don't get the kind of scalability you can get with a modern platform. These modern platforms give you dynamic scalability on demand so that you are only using the compute resources you need when you need them, and they shut down, freeing them up when you don't. Improved security. When most people think about security and the issues, you know, am I going to get hacked in that, they think SQL injection, you know, those kinds of things, websites, API is being hacked. They don't think about anybody hacking, let's say, a mainframe. Um, people, it's just kind of an assumption that the mainframe is secure, right? But if somebody were to access that data, that's typically like central, Grand Central Station. That, those are the keys to the kingdom. If somebody got a hold of that stuff, it's game over. And it's not quite the case anymore where it's just assumed to be secure. A gentleman by the name of Philip Young over the past six years has been touring security conferences, giving talks on how to do penetration tests against a mainframe. He's actually got uh, classes that you can take if you're interested. You can find out more on that on evilmainframe.com. But modern platforms help you out with this problem. The modern patching and monitoring solutions that are on these platforms, you cannot compare anywhere else. Finally, reduce cost. In any cloud platform, you're paying for what you're using, right? And if you have to run your batch jobs in a way that they only execute, let's say, a couple hours a night, but they're sitting in a servlet container where they're running, technically running, eating compute 24-7, you're wasting money. On a modern platform, you can shut those processes down so that they can be reclaimed for other things, paying for only the pieces you need. So what does batch on a modern platform look like? We start off with something like Spring Batch. Spring Batch is an uh, open source framework that provides all of the uh, batch processing capabilities that you need for a batch process. So, so things like declarative I.O., um, error handling, state management, so restart, skip, all those kinds of things, that lives within the world of Spring Batch. 
You've probably heard of a project called Spring Boot, maybe a little. Spring Boot makes Batch easier. So it does things like auto-configure the infrastructure Spring Batch needs. It provides some really cool testing utilities. Some new stuff is coming out in Spring Boot 2.1 that you should check out if you're doing batch processing. Sitting on top of Spring Boot is a new frame, newer framework called Spring Cloud Task. Spring Cloud Task is a framework designed for building finite microservices. So if you think about a microservice, let's say a REST endpoint, that is going to you know, be an externally facing API, if that goes down or if it stops processing, that's a bad thing. Spring Cloud Task is designed to build microservices for workloads that are finite. They do have an expected end. Batch processing being a pretty common use case for that, there are some additional extensions in Spring Cloud Task for Spring Batch. One is the ability to send informational messages from Spring Batch applications. So this job started or finished, this step started or finished, and so forth. The other one is to be able to dynamically scale Spring Batch. So instead of having a cluster of workers ready, sitting around waiting for your nightly batch job, Spring Cloud Task provides the ability for you to dynamically launch workers on demand on a modern platform when you need them. They'll do their work and shut back down, freeing up those resources. Now, on a modern platform, everything sits in a container. Um, so whether you create your own Docker container and you run this on uh, Kubernetes or PKS, or you do a CF push and we do it for you, we all know this ends up in a container somewhere. One important thing about this, everything in that little box is still cloud native. So the 12 and 15 factors still apply. So externalizing configuration, service discovery, all those different things still apply to your batch processes in a use case like this. Now, if you only have one or two or five or 10 batch jobs, orchestration doesn't become a big concern. Cron, maybe, uh, maybe a little Perl script. Is, that may be good enough. But we've talked to people, and they've got hundreds and thousands of batch jobs. And if you're in that situation, you need something more robust to orchestrate your batch jobs. And on a platform, we would be looking at something like Spring Cloud Dataflow. Spring Cloud Dataflow, you've probably heard quite a bit about from the streaming side of things, where it can orchestrate message-driven microservices to handle real-time style workloads. But it also orchestrates batch, batch and task applications, those finite workloads. And we're actually going to look at an example of that in just a minute. The example we're going to look at is actually a pretty simple one. I'm going to be ingesting some mainframe EBCDIC files that are defined by co COBOL copybooks. If anybody doesn't know what the heck I'm talking about, you're, I'm showing my age and I get it. But we're going to just take those EBCDIC-based, uh, like I said, copybook-defined mainframe files, and we're going to ingest them into a database, nice and simple. The architecture will look something like this. We'll start out with Spring Cloud Dataflow in the center. I'm going to use Spring Cloud Dataflow to define a stream. So that stream is going to consist of a source and a sync. The source is an SFTP source. It's going to look, it's going to pull a uh, server, and as it finds files, it will download them immediately. Now, on a modern platform, some people might wonder, well, where does the file go? Like on PAS, you don't, you get a, you don't have persistent disk typically. Your containers get, are new each time. So on a PAS environment, you, so, you do something like volume services. Uh, in Kubernetes, you do something like um, persistent volumes to have the SFTP source download to. Once the file has been downloaded, it's going to send a message to the task launching sync. It, that's telling the sync, hey, here's the file I need to run a batch job with. The task launching sync is going to then call Spring Cloud Dataflow, and Dataflow is going to launch a collection of batch jobs. Now, if I, again, have one or two files, it just willy-nilly launching containers is probably OK. But what if somebody dumps 1,000 files on me? How do we manage that? Spring Cloud Dataflow has the ability to configure concurrency so that I can work through that queue. So I can have, let's say, 1,000 files set up, and then I'm going to work through them in chunks as I go along. In this case, in my example, I'll be showing uh, concurrency set to three. So we'll be doing three uh, files at a time. Anybody know who this amazing woman is? Shout it out if you do. Yes, Admiral Grace Hopper. Uh, she's one of the uh, people that were around the uh, beginning when it came to um, developing compiler tools. And uh, some of the, her early work actually went on to be essentially used in the development of COBOL, obviously one of the early batch processes. 
Processing tools. So I already have things kind of running here. I've got MySQL, which is the database I'll be uh, in ingesting into running. I've got Rabbit, which is the communication mechanism I'm going to use between my source and sync. Those are all running. I also have Spring Cloud Dataflow running, both the server and the shell. If you've never seen Spring Cloud Dataflow before, um, it's a, a simple Spring Boot application. It's got a shell that's interactive, so I can hit tab, and uh, it tells me basically what to do. Um, it has a web UI that we can see all kinds of things. Our stream definitions, our task definitions, we'll be bouncing around a little bit this in a minute. Um, and both of those sit on top of a set of RESTful endpoints that you can consume directly if that makes sense for you. So let's go ahead and actually uh, set this up. The batch job, like I said, is really simple. I've got a reader, um, which in this case is a fixed width COBOL item reader I wrote. Um, and all it's doing is it's going to t read the file in and convert it into a POJO. In this case, it's that store POJO. The format for the file is actually defined, like I said, via a copybook. I'm actually taking this file and using that to define what the format of the file is. I'd show you the file itself, but it's actually binary. With the reader defined, I also have a writer. So my JDBC batch item writer is, again, something pretty straightforward. I provided a SQL statement. I provided a POJO. If I need to do any type of match it, or mapping between the POJO and the SQL statement, I can. In this case, I'm going to let Spring do that for me. I have a listener here. All that's going to do is do some cleanup. So as I process the files, once the file's been su successfully processed, I'm just going to go ahead and delete it, keep, keeping my environment clean. These last two pieces of code are the step and the job itself. So the step is uh, going to define how many records I process per transaction. So in this case, I'm going to process 100 records per transaction. Each transaction will then commit and process the next 100 records. So that if there's a failure along the way, I can restart after the last successful transaction. I then define my reader and writer and build it. And then I define my job, which is my flow of steps. So in this case, I only have one step, so I just call the one, but I could transition to another step or run steps in parallel and all those kinds of things. I then register my listener and call build. All of this is wrapped within Spring Boot, so th that makes it all nice and easy to execute. But in order to run it with Spring Cloud Dataflow, I need to do some stuff. So first of all, I need to register my apps. I've already done that. You'll see I've got three apps registered, a source, which is my FTP source, my sync, which is the task launcher, and then my job, which is called store ingest. All I'm doing with registering these is saying, here's where to get the bits uh, and a name, essentially. So in this case, I'm using file uh, references, but you can use things like um, Maven coordinates or a Docker hub or Docker registry as another way to register these applications. With them registered, now, I've got to need, now I need to define my stream. So my stream definition is kind of long. The important parts, though, are stream create, file ingest, that's the name, and then the definition. The definition consists of SFTP, so that's the name of my uh, first application, and then all of the properties I need to run that. So if I were running Java dash jar at the command line, I'd be doing dash dash some boot property to pass in all this stuff. So I've got like the SFTP user and password, the remote directory, the local directory, all that kinds of stuff. That's everything up until this pipe. This pipe is the delimiter between applications. And then I go to the launcher. This is the second application, the task launcher. And here, the only property I need to pass is where do I see data flow? So where is the data flow server I'm going to ask to launch those batch applications? So I'm going to create that. And then I also need to create my task that I'm going to run, my task definition. Task create store ingest, that's the name of the uh, task itself. And then definition, I have no additional properties to pass into this batch job. I've configured them all either um, with the, the job itself, cloud config, those types of things, or they're being passed in as parameters dynamically. In this case, the name of the file that I'm getting to process will be passed in dynamically there. If we bounce over here, if I do a quick refresh, the UI reflects the same things you can see on the shell. We can go over to runtime. Let 
Let me try that again. Oh, it helps if I actually deploy them. So when you create a stream, you don't necessarily have to deploy it immediately. You can deploy it later. So in this case, stream deploy, file ingest. Now it will actually go ahead and launch the applications. On a modern platform, this would be the equivalent of doing CF push for each one of the apps in the stream if you're using Cloud Foundry. In this case, it's just going to run Java processes. So in fact, I can do a JPS. And you can see those are my apps starting up. And now if we go over here and refresh the page, we can see both my applications are deployed. They're listening and waiting for me to move some files around. So let me go ahead and do that. See nothing up my sleeve. And so now I'm going to copy a bunch of files over that I've already generated into this current directory. So now you can see I've got 25 different files. They're all those based on the format. And now things just get, start to work. So if we go over here to tasks, I've got that task definition that uh, is there. But now if we go to executions, In a minute. There we go. So now, start, now the SFTP ser server is starting to pick up, uh, or source is starting to pick up files. They're being downloaded, and these jobs are running. Again, you'll notice that it's only going to keep three running at a time, because that's what I've got the concurrency set to. So once three are done, it'll pick up. Uh, the task launcher will ask for three more to be run, and they'll be run. It's important to note that the downloading piece is happening behind the scenes. So this isn't something where, oh, I need to download the file and then kick it off. All the downloading is happening behind the scenes, so it's independent of this processing or this ingestion. And so this will keep processing until uh, things wrap up. And if we look at any one of these, we can see some metadata. So we can see uh, the execution ID, task name, the arguments. This is the actual path to the file that I, that I uh, uh, processed, as well as the execution ID. It's just for some mapping. Um, we identify this as a batch job. Not all Spring Cloud tasks need to be batch jobs. You could do something like a database migration here or some data science train, model training, for example. Um, so they don't necessarily have to use Spring Batch. But if they do, Spring Cloud Dataflow provides extra functionality for that. And so if I click on here, I can see everything you'd see in the job repository for Spring Batch. So the job parameters, start time, end time, duration. Within the steps, I can see the number of reads, the number of writes, the number of commits. If there are rollbacks, if there were skips, all these kinds of things are available here. If there was an exception thrown and something failed, that would all be here available as well. I realized that this was a pretty lightning uh, view into Spring Batch. Um, and I'm hoping you'll be interested in hearing more about it. And so uh, mine and my moods talk uh, on scaling Spring Batch and the different options for that uh, is actually right after these keynotes. Um, you've got the half hour break and then you've got our talk. So I hope you check it out. Thanks, everyone. <laughs>